Um, yes, welcome everyone to our panel discussion today on starting a buying club. Um, I uh, want to address you uh, with a few remarks for a second and then I'll uh, get started introducing our panelists. Um, Buying clubs are exciting. They're, uh, they're faster to get up and running than retail storefronts, which has definitely tempted me and uh, tempts a lot of us. They require less in terms of infrastructure, uh, which can make all the difference in communities um, that maybe are not able to support a retail store. And, uh, and they can require less in terms of organizing. Uh, retail storefronts, uh, cooperative retail storefronts, typically require a long list of competencies in the core group to organize successfully. And often that is a three to five year process uh, requiring, you know, typically about a thousand members at opening. Whereas buying clubs really come in all shapes and sizes. Um, there can be a five family, uh, once a month volunteer effort. Uh, to the largest buying club I've seen is Share Wisconsin, which serves 8,000 families per month across dozens of distribution points in a three-state effort. And obviously, organizing a buying club that large uh, does not require less organizing. But uh, Food Co-op Initiative was created to really support new food co-op creation. And uh, we also support, in addition to retail brick and mortar storefronts, we also support um, organizing new buying clubs. Just to let you know where we're coming from, um, our bias is towards retail brick and mortar co-ops in the work we do uh, because of the enormous economic benefits that these bring to their communities. Uh, I haven't yet seen a $10 million buying club, but that's often a reasonable size for a retail store. And then what comes with that $10 million in revenue is the creation of jobs and local tax revenue and all kinds of great economic benefits to the local community. And that, that supports healthy communities. But not every community can support a large retail co-op, and so we, we do believe that every community should be empowered to have its own co-op and to have access to healthy food. Uh, and that's often where buying clubs can, can really fill that gap. So today, um, um, I'm going to, uh, to have a couple more short remarks, and then we will be sharing some stories uh, from people who work with buying clubs in a few different ways. Laura Tice joins us from Idaho's Bounty. She's the operations manager and one of the founding members. Shen Usley is the manager of direct sales at Frontier Natural Products Co-op, uh, one of the last remaining uh, cooperative distribution uh, companies in the country. And Laura Hansen uh, joins us from uh, Princeton University today. She is the, uh, the former organizer at uh, Stone's Throw Market in Ohio. And, uh, and Laura and I were co-organizers on the Stone's Throw Project. That's my experience organizing a new buying club. Uh, and, uh, and we are currently engaged to each other. So if you, uh, if you think that perhaps my questions today are, are being a little hard on, on Laura Hansen, then uh, you, you can be very confident that I'll be paid back for it later. Uh, and then the, the last section um, will be a question and answer uh, for our, our panelists to ask all your questions and gain the benefits of, of their experience. Myself, I mentioned that I, um, before I joined Food Co-op Initiative last year, um, I was an organizer for Stone's Throw Market. We started a new uh, co-op with the end vision of organizing a brick and mortar retail store in our community um, in kind of a rural small town in Ohio. Uh, and we created an online buying club, uh, or, or online grocery is what we called it, uh, to, uh, to get us there and provide income while we were doing that organizing process. Uh, Food Co-op Initiative, I work now with Stuart Reed, uh, creating a support system that helps new co-ops organize all around the country. So um, I believe you'll find on your screen somewhere, a widget that has uh, the, the go-to webinar widget that has a question box. Um, Joel mentioned that uh, at any point, please ask your question by typing it in the box. Uh, that will show up. Uh, we are going to save questions for the end after our panelists have gotten a chance to, to introduce themselves, and, uh, and I'm going to ask them a few questions. 
um, but we will uh, we will look forward to your questions at the, the second half of our hour together today. Our uh, first panelist, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, this webinar is being rolled out in conjunction with uh, a guide to some existing buying club resources that are available online. Uh, there, uh, there's not uh, a great distinction between a lot of the steps one takes with organizing a new buying club and uh, a lot of the steps in organizing a new food cooperative. So I uh, invite you to check out the foodcoopinitiative.coop website where we have a resource page that has uh, quite a bit of information about, um, about organizing in that, in that first stage and laying the foundation as well, and do, as, well as uh, legal incorporation work and, um, and some financial assessment tools. Um, in addition, we're creating a new guide uh, that will be available on our website at slash buying clubs. Uh, I'd say this is, this is a work in progress at the moment. We're about, uh, we're about halfway there. Uh, section one on laying the foundation and designing the vision for your, co for your buying club uh, is online and available. And uh, partially online is a section on working with vendors, both uh, uh, distribution centers like, uh, like Frontier, as well as small local farms. And Laura Thijs will be talking to us uh, a little bit more about working with local vendors. And uh, choosing and using software. This is not yet online. Uh, there's uh, two or three choices that most buying clubs work with. So our research phase is complete, and we'll be rolling out more sections um, for that uh, as time goes on. Before we jump in, a few definitions. What are we talking about here? So buying club often refers to um, both cooperatives, uh, cooperative organized buying clubs, uh, incorporated and unincorporated. Um, I'm, uh, I'm comfortable that most of what we talk about today will be applicable to all three of those types, um, but I do want to say a couple of words about incorporation versus unincorporation. If you typically want to add any kind of margin to the food as it passes through the buying club, uh, you're no longer, uh, strictly speaking, a buying club, and you're now really in the business of selling food and you're probably going to want to investigate the advantages and protections that incorporation offers. Uh, a lot of groups, especially when they're starting out or, or very small, um, are you know, perfectly content with everyone kind of volunteering, pitching in in the spirit of it, and, uh, and there is no additional margin being added to any of the goods. Um, that, that can allow you to stay unincorporated, but once you get beyond that to um, you know, an online farmer's market, uh, certainly, if you want to incorporate as cooperative or or um, add anything on top of that that might support you know, your typical cost of organizing, supporting staff, and, and so forth, you're really going to want to look into incorporation early on. And of course, if you um, want to be a cooperative, I, I find that the term co-op often applies to any kind of volunteer uh, association, but there are seven internationally recognized cooperative principles that do govern all co-ops. Um, they are voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, member economic participation, autonomy and independence, education. My favorite is cooperation among cooperatives, and of course, concern for community. So any cooperative, whether it's incorporated or not, um, will, will move itself to fall under the International Cooperative Alliance's definition uh, of a democratic association that owns and controls an enterprise and will follow these, these seven principles in its work. So if you haven't seen those before, if that's new, uh, please go check them out and uh, find that, uh, that they can have real relevance for, for how your cooperative uh, governs itself. I'd like to introduce our first panelist today, Laura Dice from Idaho's Bounty. You may have met Laura in an early webinar uh, put on last year by the Northwest Cooperative Development Center, where she uh, spoke more at length about Idaho's bounty. Um, but I, uh, I thank her very much for joining us again today to do a follow-up for folks starting new buying clubs. 
Laura, welcome, and uh, please introduce yourself and Idaho's Mountain. Hi, Jake. Thanks so much, and enjoyed talking to you with all of you. Um, I helped to start Idaho's Mountain back in 2007 um, with some AmeriCorps work that I was doing. We did a survey of their local community asking if people were interested in local food. The response was yes, so we got together with uh, probably about 40 different producers in our area to see if you could gauge their interest as well. Um, we kind of did a Excel spreadsheet buying club for the summer, and then that fall of 2007 incorporated as a nonprofit cooperative in the state of Idaho. Um, we are working to promote local food in our area and be that transportation link for farmers. Idaho is a pretty far-flung geographic region, and we're finding that more and more our producers are coming to us um, for their distribution needs. We also do manage a lot of the sales for those producers. Uh, we help to sell their products to wholesale, such as grocery stores and restaurants, but also provide a retail sales outlet as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so what percentage of your uh, work do you do with um, local farms versus, versus other types of vendors? Um, all of our farms are within the local sort of quote unquote region. Um, we do get a little bit of product from eastern, from western Montana, and some from eastern Oregon. Um, kind of, you know, northern Idaho is a lot further away from us than than those two areas. Um, so we just kind of stick with the, the southern Idaho farm region. Okay, and uh, and why local farms? Um, local farms to help support our local economy, uh, local farms to help provide food security and stability, um, and we have a more direct control or more direct visual of how those farms are treating the land, their workers, um, you know, the animals, all of that. We have that, that direct link with <clears throat> how their food is being produced, and um, you know, as national trends are continuing to show that people are really interested in that local food. Wonderful. What uh, what can you tell our our group today who might just be starting out with uh, with working with local farmers? What can you tell them about that process? Well, we found it um, kind of as I said earlier that we found it super important to meet with all of those local farms first. You know, we have the customer interest from kind of test test models that summer, um, but we also needed the, the support from the farmers as well. Um, we were able to gain support from a couple of our bigger, well-respected farmers early on um, that basically knew that this would be a good thing for them and were able to kind of voice that opinion to people, um, farmers a little more <clears throat> on the fence with this idea. Um, a lot of the questions that we got early on were, you know, well, how do we know you're going to be around in a few years? Why should we support this? We can you to come and go again. Um, I think our timing was just right that farmers were beginning to get a little bit tired here of driving really far distances to bring their, their food to farmers markets. Um, so they really kind of liked the idea of the online farmers market so that they could pre-sell a lot of their quantities and know what they would have left to take to market. Um, so having that support early on from some of our bigger farmers was, was super helpful. Um, and some of our more forward-thinking farmers, too, saw that using the technology could help them save time and spend more time in the field. Great. That's a, that's a wonderful transition to my next question for you. Speaking of technology, uh, what, what kind of software has been powering Idaho's Bounty? So we started out using, it's called Local Food Co-op Software. Um, it's kind of a spin-off of the Oklahoma food model. Um, they started, oh, I don't know, I guess sooner than, longer ago than 2007. Um, they started with doing a once-a-month big buying club um, in Oklahoma City, and they had an open source software set that we were able to grab onto um, and have used that ever since. Although, um, as we'll talk about probably in a second here, we're starting to outgrow that. Um, we've been able to support a once-a-week delivery cycle, so an open and close. We open Thursday morning at 8 and close Monday morning at 10, and then those food deliveries are delivered Wednesday. Um, so that's kind of been our schedule over the last um, four or five years, and now as we expand into wholesale markets, um, we're finding that we need to run our truck about three times a week, and um, the software is not supporting that the invoicing um, with those multiple delivery days. 
Mm -hmm. So you uh, you started on on that software. What uh, what were some of the advantages uh, that you experienced as a as a newer group? Um, it was a great way for us to get off the ground with really low overhead. Um, the software you know, needs kind of little support, um, sort of an in-house developer to get it uh, customized to your own your own group. Um, but then it's it's open source, so with you know, the exception of paying your developer, it's it's a free software to use. Um, so that with no warehouse, no you know, real big overhead, um, that was a really easy way for us to kind of get going and just to test the model to see if it was going to work or not. Um, it was a great way to, you know, to start to pool all of that information that had been passed around verbally or you know, through emails or phone calls. Um, it was a really great way to start to house that information all in one place. And uh, we just had a question come in asking us to, to repeat the name of the software. Um, that's the, the Oklahoma model software available yeah, at... Uh, all what's well, called local food co-op software. Yeah, I think it's actually at like localfoodcoop.org or something, something along those lines. Oh so, yeah. Uh, and before uh, before we started the the call today, you were mentioning um, about the essentially the needs of of using the software is is really having a, a developer in house. Can you elaborate any on that? Yeah, I believe um, Roy Bessinger, who has been hosting that software for some time now, he took it over from Oklahoma about five years ago. Um, I believe he's had to take some other work, so I'm not sure what his availability is to answer questions on that. But if you've got a great developer in-house or you know, as part of your board or something like that, um, I think the software is still available, easy to use, um, and, and get started. Um, but I'm not sure how available he is anymore to answer questions on that. Um, so, what are you? What kind of software are you looking to use now? Well, we did um, took some time this fall to do quite a bit of research on what available models there were out there. Um, we ran into a lot of different um, things, and some you know wouldn't fit our business model. Some fit our business model. Some were proprietary, some were too expensive. Um, so for us, we are now looking to use Local Food Marketplace. Um, they have a similar set of software, um, but the main advantages include um, multiple delivery days per week. So we can basically run you know, as many wholesale cycles as we wanted and, you know, and as many retail cycles as we wanted per week. The advantage of that is that you know, if you had a bunch of different locations, you could run those sales cycles on different days. Um, and you can run overlapping wholesale and retail cycles. Uh, with that, producers are able to choose how many quantities they want to go to each uh, market. So if they you know, want to participate in wholesale only, they could do that. Wanting to participate in retail only, you know, all of those options are available. So mm -hmm. I think that will help to support us um, with our rare wholesale sales that we're, we're um, continuing to reach. And in addition to uh, going to the local food marketplace, uh, are you pursuing uh, another software project? Yeah, we're still kind of reaching out to other groups. Um, there's a lot of activity. It's really interesting. We started kind of because we started with the local food co-op software um, because of kind of the first thing we discovered. It was free. It seemed really available to us. Um, since that point, there's been so much more activity with technology, um, looking to support groups. You know, buying plus food hubs, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of different projects out there right now. We're just kind of continuing to reach out to groups, um, potentially looking to partner with new opportunities, creating other software um, that might support our business model um, even better. So if people are interested in um, you know, talking to you more in depth about what that project might look like, um, they can definitely contact me. OK, great. So if, if others would be interested in getting in on on some of that software development to meet the needs of, of buying clubs and, and local food hubs, it um, would be great to send you an email and, and let you know. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, we're not exactly sure what that looks like right now, but it's kind of in the information gathering um, process right now. Awesome. Um, all right, one more question before we, we switch things up. Um, I love asking this question. Uh, what do you know now that you wish you had known at the beginning of Idaho's Bounty? 
Um, you know, it was I started with very little funds, and um, you know, we got lucky with some really great farmers early on, and some really great organizers early on. I don't know what we would have done much differently. Um, it was I wish that we would have been able to hire a general manager about you know two to three years sooner. We just hired our first general full time general manager last January. Um, and that's really, really helped us springboard into a more stable business. Um, we didn't have anybody really overseeing um, the whole operations and where we were going. So I think if groups can, you know, have whatever little funds they can to hire somebody to oversee everything, I think that really, really moves things along a lot more efficiently um, and with a lot greater opportunity for success. Um, and I would say too, with that, um, creating a business plan early on. Um, for however small or large your idea is, is a must. A lot of um, local community groups have small business um, groups that might be able to help you write that business plan for free. Um, but that really helps everybody keep the same vision together and really take a aim for, for where the group is going. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Jake. And we had several questions come in while you were speaking, uh, and I look forward to asking you uh, a couple more questions in the Q&A portion. Sounds good. All right. Uh, moving over next to Laura Hansen. Um, Laura, please introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your experience with uh, Stone's Throw Market. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. You're loud and clear. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Laura. I am currently a Master in Public Affairs graduate student at Princeton University. But for the two years prior to that, I was working with Jake as a co-organizer of Stone's Throw Market. Um, so we're basically, we were basically a retail food co-op organizing effort in Miami County, Ohio. So our vision was of a brick and mortar, full service grocery store that would be owned and, and utilized by the community. And we attempted to pave the way by running an online pre-order grocery, worked in partnership with several local businesses, including a local meat market. And so in addition to this vision of organizing a brick and mortar store, we ran a weekly um, online grocery cycle where we collaborated with farmers to make produce, meat, et cetera, available to members of our cooperative. Great. And, and how big was, uh was that online grocery while you were there? Well, so our cooperative started in late 2009. And um, within about six to eight months, we had about 160 member owners. Um, about 15, about a dozen of those people were active at our in our core team, on our organizing team for the cooperative. And then I would say probably 50 to 60 placed orders in the online grocery on a weekly basis. So um, so at our peak, we probably took in about $2,500 a month. But that money was, you know, our, our labor margin there was about 25%. So we had, in addition to our organizing team, we also had two full-time staff members, Jake and myself. Um, and so, you know, if you do the math, that doesn't work out um, for two uh, it works out such that we had two kind of overextended staff members um, for the work that was required to simultaneously organize the buying club aspect and the cooperative organizing. You said twenty five hundred a month. Was that? Or, uh, sorry, sorry, a week in sales. So about twenty five hundred a week in sales with about a twenty five percent labor margin. Okay, so twenty five hundred a month for for labor and expenses and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, what were what were the perceived advantages of having the buying club um, that uh, that caused us to go down that route? Well, so initially, I don't think we really considered our online grocery to be a buying club per se. I mean, our vision initially was really to establish a brick and mortar cooperative grocery store, and we saw the online grocery as providing something tangible for potential members of our cooperative. So we were sort of you know, impatient to get our cooperative off the ground, and we thought that having this online grocery buying club would be a vehicle in order to pay full-time staff members and then also um, you know, have, have sort of a weekly activity that could bring our group together. 
also, I mean, there's something to be said for a vision you can taste, and that was the phrase that we used oftentimes when we were explaining the idea of the online grocery to potential members. Um, I mean, it provided direct benefits to our membership. Only member owners of the cooperative were allowed to participate in the online grocery. And it also created a, a weekly opportunity for us to check in with those 50 or 60 people who were regularly active and get to know some of the farmers in the area. Uh, and that, that sounds pretty good. Um, how, what, were the, what were the disadvantages that you began to perceive? Um, well, so initially, I think there was a lot of momentum behind the online grocery. It was sort of exhilarating to, you know, start something new and different. And it was really, um, I think, easy for us to focus on the tangible aspects of starting up that online grocery. Um, the problem was that it, it soon became a distraction from our, our larger vision of establishing a brick-and-mortar grocery store. And so instead of spending time on membership recruitment or outreach or you know, training board members developing the organization, we ended up spending a lot of our bandwidth on the online grocery, just you know, putting orders together, together every week. Um, and since our two full-time staff members were primarily responsible for running not only the online grocery, but also thinking about the bigger picture of the organization, um, it ended up um, that a, a lot of our focus was more on sort of the immediate and tangible rather than the more long-term and abstract. Um, so, you know, to, to a certain extent, the, the main disadvantage was that because we focused on the immediate and the tangible, we compromised our vision. Um, the, the, 40, the 50 to 60 people who were involved on a weekly basis, we kind of I mean, those were people that we personally invited. Those were people that we knew and we saw every single week, you know, the, the choir, if you will. Um, but as they, as they began to invite their friends to be part of the cooperative, what they talked about wasn't the bigger vision of the retail food store, of the retail community on grocery. It was, oh, well, I can get this really great organic milk, and oh, you can find quinoa at this really great price, and oh, we work with our local farmers. And so they really tried to sell their friends more on the buying club than on the future vision of the retail grocery store. And that, in turn, influenced you know, who joined the cooperative and what their interests were. Um, and then the other challenge was that because um, we had something tangible for people to evaluate our group when they were thinking about joining. You know, we had people who looked at our online grocery and said, oh, well, you know, I might be interested in a food co-op, but I'm not interested in this online grocery. And so, you know, in some ways we attracted certain people, but in others we, um, we turned off potential supporters who were just really not interested in, in the online buying club, online grocery model. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we often talked about how our online grocery was sort of like a church, if you will. And so, in a certain sense, we created an opportunity for those 50 or 60 people to participate every week. Those were sort of the core faithful. Um, but the problem was that there were lots of other people who, you know, believed in what we were doing. They believed in the bigger picture, but they were turned off by sort of the implicit expect expectation that they needed to participate every week. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so that was, you know, we definitely encountered some big challenges along the way. So uh, one last question. Thanks for, for sharing that. Uh, what advice would you have for groups that have started down this path on the way to a retail food co-op? Well, so I think it's probably worth sitting down and really evaluating what your goals are. So if your goal really is to start up a retail food co-op, you might want to think about refocusing your energy on that bigger vision. So you might want to evaluate whether or not you, you should deorganize your buying club um, if it's become a distraction. Um, that being said, I think it's really, really hard to um, stop something once you've started. And so you have to evaluate the costs and benefits of, of um, of reshifting your focus and energy. Another strategy might be simply to make sure that your um, 
your key organizers, so if you have full-time staff members, especially your part-time staff, that they're really focusing their energy on, on the longer-term vision and um, membership recruitment, organizational development and training, and if you have a point person um, who could perhaps be more focused on, on the buying club, then you might be able to sort of delineate responsibilities, put that partition up, and make sure that it's separate from the bigger, bigger vision activities. Well, great. Good advice. Uh, thank you very much. And there were a couple questions that came in while you were talking. I look forward to asking you when we get to our QA section after our next panelist. Okay. Thanks very much. Shannon, our, uh, our next panelist. Uh, Shannon, it was like on us from Frontier Natural Products Co-op. Uh, Shannon, please introduce yourself and, and Frontier and, and how Frontier works with uh, buying clubs. Um, hi, everybody, and thanks, uh, Jake, for making the connection and getting me invited. Um, we are interesting. You know, we're a co-op. Um, uh, we've been a co-op for 35 years, so we've been around for quite a while. Um, and we serve buying clubs as well as independent cooperative food stores, traditional brick and mortar stores. Um, and so we have kind of that, as far as our audiences, we're interested in, in both of those audiences. Um, our buying clubs are our third largest category of customer. We have about 4,500 clubs total, but I'd say the real active ones that probably purchase, um, you know, at least, you know, you could say once in the past 12 months are probably closer to around 2,500 clubs um, all across the United States. We're not um, really sent. We are located in Iowa, but we have clubs everywhere in the U.S. Um, I'd say the heart of our buying club business are clubs that are um, our minimum requirement is five households, and um, I'd say the core is like five up to about 20 households. Uh, we do have some that are really large, um, but I'd say the heart is kind of the smaller to mid-sized club. Um, we have kind of two sides to our business. We manufacture our own brands. So we have Frontier bottled spices, and, and then we also have Frontier bulk um, spices and herbs. We also have Oracacia, which is our own brand of aromatherapy and essential oil products. And we also manufacture Simply Organic, which is organic line of um, spices, extracts, baking mixes, dip mixes. So that makes up about maybe 3,000 of our product portfolio or those items that are available to the club. And then we have about 9,000 to 10,000 products that we bring in from other manufacturers. So from us, you could also purchase things like Burt's Bees, Kiss My Face, Avalon, Green Mountain Coffee, um, Ecover, 7th Generation, just kind of the top brands that you would associate. And our, our focus is really um, non-perishables, um, you know, our spices and such obviously have a, a decent shelf life, um, but a lot of our items are home and body care items, culinary accessories, um, some children's products. Um, so we don't do refrigerated um, products or frozen products or like fresh produce. Mm -hmm. so There's an idea of our product portfolio too that people can choose from. So that's kind of the summary. I, I um, manage the direct side, which to me is everything that our members need, not only products, but also our service to our members. And um, I mean, we really are a member-oriented um, organization. You pay $10 one time and you're a member for life. And we have patronage for our members and um, we share in our success. So that's a little bit about Frontier. Well, thank you. Uh, how have you seen the sector change over the years that Frontier has been providing buying clubs? Um, well, I'm I'm relatively new on board, so I can at least give you my perspective. As as I've been here about a year and a half, and and looking historically, clubs have always been around for us and always an important customer segment for us. But it really seems in the past um, year and a half to two years, there's almost been kind of a resurgence in the importance of clubs as a customer member. And um, we've had growth in that category, whereas some of our other categories have either been flat or, or slowing. Um, so it, it's growing, and there seems to be um, 
a high amount of interest in how do we start it, how do we work with you. Um, so I've actively kind of pursued um, growing that customer segment for us. Excellent. Um, well, I'd love to, to hear how you answer those questions. How do we start and how do we work with you? Um, really for us, um, it sounds pretty straightforward, but um, we have we require a minimum of five households. So really what you'll find for us is maybe a, a group of people at work or a group of people in a neighborhood or family members um, join together with five households. Someone needs to kind of be the point person. And they don't kind of need to. They need to be the point person. <laughs> and that person is really the owner of the account with us. Um, and you basically, you know, fill out the required paperwork, you pay your $10, you register your households with us that are in the club, and then you have full access to our online catalog and our printed catalog. And there's no minimum. People can order $10 worth of product if they want to, or $1,000 worth of product. Um, Shipping, though, I mean, a lot of clubs are looking for free shipping, and that's at $250. So we do have those sorts of minimums, but you can buy whatever you want. And we also work in um, eaches, which is pretty popular because we don't require case amounts on most things. Sometimes we'll have something unique that has a case requirement, but most of the time we, we'll, we'll split cases and just send eaches to, to the household as well. Um, that's, yeah, go ahead. That would be something that the, that the buying club wouldn't have to worry about then. It's a right. service you offer. Right. So when you get your box, um, if some one household wants to order one bottle of Avalon shampoo and another one wants one bottle of Bird's Bees shampoo, that's completely fine with us. You'll get a single bottle of each one in your box. Then, of course, yeah. the recipient needs to split those out for the five households or whatever. Gotcha. So what things can buying clubs do to be successful when they're working with, with Frontier or with, with any other vendor? I think the biggest thing for us is just from a service standpoint is um, order consolidation. Um, finding some way that you as a club has your order organized in a way that um, is A, either easy for our customer service rep to work with you over the phone to get it entered into our system, or B, you have your own system, be it as rudimentary as Excel, and you each pass it around and fill it out. And then you have one point person who goes onto our online website and, and puts in the entire order together. So I think kind of just order organization and consolidation is probably the most important part. Gotcha. Uh, are there any things that uh, you see a lot of buying clubs do that you, you kind of wish they, they wouldn't do? Uh, Stumbling blocks? No, you know. Not really. We we just had a focus group with buying clubs about eight months ago, and it just really went very well for us. I mean, our, our clubs seem to be pretty sat, you know satisfied. Um, there's some things obviously that we can always look at improving, but as far as our working relationship, it's pretty smooth. If you if a club keeps their order organized and and inputs it into our system, um, it's pretty straightforward. And you know we don't have any requirements on when you have to order or how much, so we're pretty flexible. Gotcha. Uh, any other advice for for people that might be considering starting a new buying club today? Um, I think the most I heard from members in the focus group was making sure that you do have someone that will kind of own that organization process. And like you know our clubs are really small where there's not people aren't really in it probably most of the time to make any money on it. It's, they're in it because they want to order the product together and, and get the product at wholesale price. So um, I think having someone kind of take the reins and, and, and um, control the organization is probably a challenge for some folks. And also I think delivery, I heard that that's a challenge often too, um, where one household gets the entire order and then um, organizing that a way for each other household to come get their product. I think is a big challenge. So if you can figure those out, the ordering and the pickup, those seem to be two key things. Gotcha. Good insight. Um, and uh, we had a question come in about the amount of time it might require to get a buying club started. Is that something that kind of came out of your focus group? Do you have any idea on, on whether if it's a more simple volunteer process, if what kind of time expectations there would be on a point person? 
I think for us, since a lot of our clubs are on probably, you know, the 5 to 20 um, household type, um, it, it can really be as simple as meeting together and um, coming up with the ordering process and who's going to head it up and keep it organized and supplying your household information to us and, and keeping your records updated so that we know what households are in the club. Um, for, so for us, it's, it's a lot of small clubs, and I think it's just kind of a grassroots thing where you do it at a household level. So in other words, it doesn't sound like there would be a barrier for someone with a you know, full-time job and family that they could easily pick that up? All the clubs that I had here for the focus group, all of them who were the prime, I had the primary organizer here, they were all full-time workers, and they, they did this as more of a, a way for their family to have access to. Where we live in Iowa, a lot of clubs came from Iowa. There's not a lot of choices in some areas of Iowa where you can go to get good access to natural and organic food. So, or, and product in general, not just food. But um, so, yeah, I think that um, the small clubs, you know, seem to have a pretty good, um, not a lot of barriers to getting set up. Great. Well, thank you very much. And a couple other questions came in while we were chatting, and uh, and we will we will get to those. We're now entering into our uh, Q and A section. Uh, so thank you again, Shannon. And Joel, you want to pick a question and, uh, and get us started off? Sure, Jake. Don't mind if I do. Uh, let's see. We had a question that I thought was interesting from Michelle. She says, uh, I work a full-time demanding job and have a family but want to work with a friend to get a buying club started, is this unrealistic with the time demands, or you just need many people to make it work? Uh, so I think Shannon just uh, weighed in on that from Frontier's perspective. Um, Laura Feiss or, or Laura Hansen, um, would you all have any uh, additional comments on that? And you I'll go ahead. Um, we, yeah, we had um, most of our organizers um, had other jobs, but we quickly found that we really needed someone that was um, around full time to answer questions and really make sure we were on the right track. Um, so I think you know not everyone needs to be um, necessarily devoting all of their time to it, but making sure that there is a strong leader, um, I think, will will continue to move the process a whole lot stronger and a whole lot faster. Um, than if everybody's devoting their time elsewhere as well. Gotcha. Thank yeah. you. And, and I'll just add to that really quickly. Um, this is Laura Hansen. I think that um, it sort of depends how you think of your buying club. So if you think of it as a business that needs to sort of adhere to business service standards, it is important to have someone, not necessarily who's going to be full-time, depending on the scale, but someone who could always be available to answer questions um, with your members. I think if you're thinking of it more as sort of a neighborhood community service, um, it's certainly more efficient to always have one point person who can ultimately be responsible and make decisions. Um, but I think that's a job that's a little bit more easily shared among a bigger group of people. Great. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, it was specifically uh, for Laura Dice, um, but our other panelists, please jump in if you, if you have anything to add. Uh, how did you have the funds, or how would you have the funds as a buying club to hire a general manager? Well, we do a markup on our products, so our producers set their own prices. Um, they set that price in the system, and then currently we have a 35% markup on retail products and an 18.5% markup on wholesale products. So it's a, it's a tiny, tiny margin. Um, so that, with private donations and some grants, um, we were able to get off the ground and pay, pay a, a part-time general manager, and then now both through operating um, capital and and still grants and donations, um, we pay our general manager. And Laura, you all had also mentioned that 
if you could do it all over again, being able to hire that general manager earlier uh, would have been would have been great. Uh, do you have any thoughts for how you might have been able to do that before you were able to add a margin to sales? Yeah, I think it was just kind of partly how um, the staffing that we had at the time. I've been part time kind of throughout working another job to kind of make make ends meet. Um, but I think had we had our board board seen that sooner. Um, we might have been able to rearrange some of those funds and, you know, pay, pay one person full time rather than a bunch of people part time. It, it really depends on kind of how it all comes together um, and who those players are in your organizing structure. Um, but I think, yeah, we should have paid one full time person rather than a bunch of part time people. I think that would have helped us um, be a little bit stronger earlier on. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to. Go ahead and, and jump to the next question. We've got uh, a fair list of them. Um, for Laura Hansen, based on your experience, do you think the drawbacks of the online grocery would also apply to a seasonal weekly farmer's market uh, sponsored by a startup co-op trying to move toward a brick and mortar store? Um, well, so again, every every organizing group has their own situation. Um, what I would encourage you to think about is what what is your goal? And so what we found was that our goal was to engage people and get them involved and provide something tangible to potential member owners through this online grocery. Um, and we found that that became a really big distraction from our ultimate goal, which was to start a brick and mortar grocery store. So, um, I mean, there's certainly something to be said for having, you know, a, an outreach event at your farmers market every week. In fact, I would be, um, I would be sort of surprised if um, you have a local farmers market and you're starting a food co-op and um, and, and your group wasn't there, at least from time to time. Um, but again, stepping back and really thinking about what is your purpose, what is your goal, and um, I, I would encourage you to, to think about, so what kind of resources in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of energy, in terms of morale, would you spend setting up some sort of um, sales program at a farmer's market, multiply that by three, and then add a little padding, and that's probably how much time it will actually take. And so I think that, um, you know, outreach and a presence in the community is really, really positive. Um, trying to do sales at a farmer's market, I could, I could see that as, as definitely being a distraction. Um, but again, you need to think about what your purpose is and what your goals are and what resources it would take. All right, thank you. Um, next question, let's see, uh, for Shannon. Um, in order to, to place orders with Frontier, is it uh, COD or advanced payment, or do you, do you ever offer terms to your buying club members? Um, yeah, we do, we do have 30-day um, net terms that can be set up for buying clubs as well, but there's certain requirements to, to get those terms. But in general, your shipping is just included on your order. Gotcha. So that's something that, that each individual group can pursue with you? Yes. Would they be able to start out as net 30, or, or would you graduate to that eventually? Or? You, and that's a great question. I'd have to follow up with finance um, to really understand what the requirements are. But um, I believe you start out with just your shipping is standard applied to your order. But then once you develop a certain history and credit um, with us, then I think you would graduate if you wanted that available. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. All right. Another question um, for, for Laura Thais and Laura Hansen. Uh, how many people were in your initial planning groups uh, for your, your buying clubs? Um, Laura, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, we, I think, probably had about seven different people. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but um, we, we had a really great group of some with business experience, 
um, some with more networking experience. We also had a really great grant writer um, that we were really lucky to have. Um, I probably should um, center my talk a little bit more on to um, some of the grants. We were able to get off the ground um, because of a Farmers Market Promotion Program um, USDA grant. And um, I can't find it right now, but I'll get it to Jake. Um, some really great grant resources for um, food hub sort of buying club groups. There's a lot of grant money out there right now. Um, so we were yeah, really lucky to have a, a diverse group of people with that, that initial um, planning group of about seven people. Yeah, and this is Laura Hansen. I would say that we our, our initial planning group probably started at five to seven and then inched up more to 12 or 15. Um, but again, we had, that was our organizing group for the retail food co-op. And so some of those people were not at all involved in, most of those people were not at all involved in the sort of day-to-day -day responsibilities of the online grocery. Um, we really only had two people who were um, kind of 100% focused on or responsible for the online grocery, and that was myself and Jake, our two full-time staff members. Um, although we also had member owners who you know, were involved in the process and volunteered with various aspects of the online grocery, but they weren't kind of key point people in that organizing process. All right. Thank you. Um, and uh, a question for Laura Hansen. Um, can you please elaborate on how you balanced community organizing and running the buying club? Uh, and then there's a follow-up question. In your opinion, did it take longer to open the actual store? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, I think our strategy was just to run really fast. Um, I mean, Jake and I put in a lot of hours, um, sometimes 60, 80, a few times 100 hours a week, um, just in this sort of frenzied effort to, you know, deliver a certain quality of service for the online grocery because that was, we sort of thought of that as part of the image we were projecting to the community. We set a pretty high bar for ourselves. Um, and then simultaneously trying to do organizational development and training, attending conferences, writing a business plan, fundraising for the feasibility and market studies, um, so I would say that um, in hindsight, a lot I would have I would have definitely preferred to focus 100% um, of my attention just on organizing the brick and mortar store, um, or at least a better balance skewed in that direction. Um, there's this kind of it's a psychological phenomenon I think that it's much easier for us to kind of do the tasks that are easy to define or, and are right in front of us with a deadline. Um, and those are the tasks of the online grocery. Um, it's much more difficult to figure out how to complete tasks that are related to more abstract or long-term goals. Um, and so those often sort of fall by the wayside when you have a lot of immediate tangible deadlines. Um, so I found that to be a challenge, but definitely um, a learning experience. And could, the, the second part of the question, can you repeat that? Uh, was, do you feel that it, uh, it took longer to open the actual store? Oh, OK, of course. Um, well, so Stone Store Market has not yet opened a brick and mortar retail location. And this is three years later. Um, and as, as I said earlier, the, the folks who, who joined the cooperative a little bit later on in the visioning process, you know, what they really saw was the online grocery. So their vision um, was more focused on the online grocery than on the brick and mortar store. And I think that really slowed down some of our momentum. Um, so we've completed a, a market study for a physical location, but um, I'm not. I'm not optimistic that a retail storefront will be opening anytime in the next year or two. Right. Thanks. A uh, question came in. Our first question, actually, um, about what do you feel is the necessity of having a a shopping cart or some way to do online orders, and um, to think about uh, the. Our question asker wants to maintain face um, with uh, with their customers. 
uh, but doesn't want to lose orders um, done in emails or on the phone. And uh, I'll throw that out to uh, Laura Thice. Do you want to start that off? Yeah. Um, well, I guess we found um, for collating, um, we do about 100 retail orders a week and about 15 wholesale restaurants and grocery stores a week and have about 65 different farmers in that network. Um, so for collecting all of that information, um, we really found the online to be an efficient model. Um, managing that many phone calls, managing that many emails or texts um, to, with all of that product, I think we have about probably 900 products listed per week. Um, so to manage that kind of number and amount of information, I really don't think that any way but online um, without a physical store is possible. So I think um, that customer interaction is really important, and we do we have that with our pickup. We also um, work really hard to host a few events per year with farmers. Um, you know, maybe host a sampling at a grocery store. We do um, an event in the fall called Taste of Idaho's Bounty, which we bring about um, 20 of our farmers in and do a really great event with where our chefs prepare all of their food. So we try to maintain that connection with the farmers um, and the customers that people like so much with farmers markets. Um, but farmers are really able to save time by putting their products and inventories up online and sell to um, our whole member base um, you know, with just a few clicks. So I think managing that amount of information is, has really been efficient online. Great. Thank you. Um, Laura Hansen, would you add anything to that? No, I'll just chime in. Um, I think, Laura, I would agree with everything that you said and um, specifically emphasize that, um, I mean, the prospect of, I mean, we were doing more on the order of 60 to sometimes 80, um, 80 orders a week, and it's, it's really hard for me to imagine processing that many manually or over the phone. We did our very, very first order when we were sort of in beta test mode. Um, manually, so everyone filled out a, you know, a paper order form and we compiled them by hand. And it took, I mean, it took several days to, um, to do that manually. And it, I think it would just be, it'd be really difficult to do that every single week. Um, that being said, and again, at Pickup, um, that's, that's another great opportunity to chit chat with people as they come to pick up their groceries or at delivery. Great, thank you. All right, I think we've got time for, for one more quick question uh, before we got to call it. And uh, I, this sounds like a question for Laura Thice and Laura Hansen. Did you start off charging membership fees or did that develop over time uh, of the online buying option? Mm -hmm. um, I can speak to that really quickly. So we, um we don't charge, we never charged fees, but we did um, make the online grocery um, limited to member owners of the cooperative. And so we had a $90 member ownership share that um, members of the cooperative paid in order to not only join the co-op, but also to participate in the online grocery. And that was from the very beginning. And we were on a, a we were on a similar program. Um, when we started, we had a seventy-five dollar lifetime membership for our member owners, and that was producers and members, um, customer members alike. Um, we found that that hot the seventy-five dollars was a little bit um, a lot too, too much to bite off for some customers. It, it's kind of a strange process. When you, when you go online, you don't necessarily know exactly what the product's going to look like, how big it is, that sort of thing. So it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a strange process. Um, the people at that $75 rate were kind of unwilling to try us. Um, this past year, we lowered it to $10 per year, and then $60 per year for retail members or for producer members. And we found that we, within the first few months, we were able to gain a lot more members. Um, people were a lot more willing to talk about $10 a year um, than $75 a lifetime. So we found that to be a more effective structure, and are looking at, at keeping that now. Okay, thank you. Well, we are out of time, and so I am going to have to call it, but I would love to thank again our wonderful panelists. Uh, thank you, Laura Dice, Laura Hansen, and Shannon Oosley very much for, for taking the time to, uh, to talk with me and, and to talk with all of our 
interested guests today. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of our guests as well for, uh, for stopping by and, uh, and joining the discussion. If, you're, if your question um, did not get answered, we, we ran out of time. We had questions in the queue, uh, so that's great. Uh, but, but please do send me an email, uh, pass along your question and, and a phone number. I'd be happy to uh, give you a call and, and follow up offline. Uh, and I'd like to extend a thank you as well to uh, Joel Brock, who's been providing our technical support today, uh, and CDS Consultant Cooperative, who has, uh, who has helped us out with providing our webinar service and doing the recording. Uh, the session uh, has been recorded, and uh, we will be sending out an email to our newsletter list when it's online, along with uh, these slides. And uh, so if you are not yet on our newsletter mailing list, please sign up. You can do that on our website. Um, again, a big thank you, and uh, I hope you join us next time.